Hello, I'm Patrick Jenkins, the FT's financial editor. I'm here with Fitch today to talk about disruption in deal making. And I'm joined now by Monsieur Hussein, who is the global head of regulatory research at Fitch. Monsieur, welcome. Thank you. Um, there are many obstacles to M&A in banking, as we've seen over recent years. There hasn't been a whole lot of certainly uh, large scale M&A. In Europe, given the um, performance problems of many banks, there's even more chatter that this is needed now, M more M&A is needed. A lot of people talk about the need though for banking union to be in place before we're gonna get any big cross-border mergers. In particular, the lack of a kind of uh, cross-regional deposit guarantee scheme is cited as a reason for not doing deals. It, do you see that as a, as a real obstacle? Well, certainly it's very important because it's all about basically ensuring the full fungibility of capital and liquidity, which will essentially make it far more efficient for banks to manage their scarce resources um, between their subsidiaries. And ultimately, really what it comes down to is that without the completion of the banking union, banks cannot manage their assets and liabilities efficiently, which means that we don't have uh, lower costs for consumers and for corporates and ultimately this is not going to be uh, completed until we have the full European Deposit Insurance Scheme in place and the harmonisation of national insolvency which will hopefully break this sovereign bank nexus or doom loop um, in terms of the relationship between banks and the sovereigns. Um, so really I think cross-border M&A is dependent up on this outcome. Um, however, it doesn't necessarily rule out uh, smaller uh, M&A activity um, on a national level, of course, just so that um, there isn't a particularly compelling case for cross-border consolidation until we have, in effect, uh, a perfected internal market. So you, you haven't really seen any large-scale cross-border deals. Um, there's a current deal that people talk about now, now that the Deutsche Bank Commerzbank Bank uh, kind of talks have founded, uh, there's a lot of suggestions that maybe Commerzbank Bank will be bought by another European bank, perhaps Unicredit, perhaps ING. Um, regardless of the political issues attached to that, um, uh, which, which are a separate issue altogether, does banking union or the lack of, of, of the deposit uh, guarantee scheme uh, get in the way of, of that type of deal, do you think? Certainly, I think it makes a difference when you consider cross-border um, consolidation due to the fact that it's optically a little tricky to imagine Finnish depositors agreeing to back Italian uh, leasing assets, for instance. And so for that reason, you don't have the full fungibility of capital and liquidity. That being said, there are still ways for banks to book their assets onto subsidiaries balance sheets where they enjoy um, good liquidity for instance but it's still going to be a difficult um, issue. Now another topic in EU banking has been uh, the buzz theme of open banking as kind of new uh, rules that oblige banks to open up their systems uh, to third parties. Um, how do you see that as, as having played out? Has it been a bit of a damp squib up to now? I think it's actually a fair comment because if you look at Europe, for instance, the UK is the market where there's been a greatest degree of, uh, of fintechs um, issuing third-party applications to allow for interface with uh, banks. And we've got around 80 applications and frankly they're all focusing on similar aspects such as budgeting and or uh, and analyzing your expenditure and really there hasn't been much in the way of credit provision and in that regard I think it's fair to say that the UK falls far behind other countries particularly in the Far East when it comes to the rise of fintechs challenging banks dominance and we can see that in the UK with regards to the challenger banks with online presence such as Monzo and Starlink compared to the incumbents barely any switching has occurred with Monzo accounting for just 6,000 net 
uh, editions in April, styling around 4,000 editions f with incumbent banks far surpassing those numbers. Um, but although there is a slow start, I think it's important to understand that where there's going to be competition for deposits in particular, those costs will increase for banks and the incumbent uh, banks in, and the new uh, entrants. And I think in that regard, there is going to be a uh, potential loss of stickiness in banks' deposits, which could play into broader financial stability concerns, where you may have in the future an aggregator choosing to switch instantaneously between banks' terms of deposits, which could then quickly facilitate a bank run. And so from that perspective, I think it could represent a challenge for uh, resolution authorities to understand how to uh, deal with those uh, systemic crises and really how do uh, you control uh, the role of outsourcing with regards to big tech, big data as well. Yeah, because there's a fine balance, isn't it, between kind of encouraging competition, if you like, through technology and managing financial stability. That goes to the heart of it. How does all of this, the, the, the open, open banking debate, um, tie into M&A? Is it in any way uh, encouraging M&A or likely to encourage M&A, do you think? So far, there's very few signs that open banking is directly encouraging M&A or consolidation sector. I think what's more important is really the rise of uh, fintech and in particular the role of big tech in providing uh, financial services importantly in payments processing. So for instance in China where you've got the big tech providers Tencent and Alibaba accounting for 19% of GDP uh, in terms of payment processing and you have uh, in other uh, regions such as in Singapore and Malaysia and Hong Kong the rise of virtual banks and uh, open banking licenses which will spur competition. Uh, that being said to date it's not really had a significant impact but I think the fear is amongst particularly mid-sized banks is that they'll have to significantly up their spending in IT and infrastructure and I think that in turn has led to uh, banks questioning whether or not they need to increase their size in order to spread the cost of those investments and for instance you can look at BB&T's purchase of SunTrust as an example of where it's been specifically cited as a rationale for uh, consolidation. So I think the jury's out in terms of how far it will um, go and how long it will take, but certainly it, it, it will lead to an increased investment digitalization, which will ultimately spur consolidation for those players who simply can't bear the cost. What about smaller fintechs as the targets of M&A? Because we have seen some banks uh, around the world, uh, some of the bigger banks, especially the Spanish, actually BBVA and Santander, both kind of uh, setting up specific uh, funds uh, I think 100 million uh, plus uh, euros um, to buy up either stakes or whole businesses. Um, is that something that we're likely to see more of as, as banks look to either make sure they're not um, outcompeted by fintechs or just look to, to buy in either talent or cultural change or, or growth, I suppose? Sure. I mean, I think you've given some really good examples with regards to BBA as as, and I think that the, those are probably instances of acquiring, so you to acquire startups in order to get the talent. And certainly with BBVA's um, large minority stake in Atom Bank and a startup in, in, in Finland and um, Simple Bank in, in USA, uh, certainly those are good examples of bolt on acquisitions um, which may increase their product offerings to clients and customers and to important segments of the small to medium enterprise. Um, in particular. However, I think at the moment it's a little bit of a checkered um, success rate. For instance, with regards to the purchase of, of Simple, uh, BB of A have taken significant write downs on their investments. Um, I think it's probably going to be of a greater concern for um, smaller banks that essentially are challenged to find the right talent and they may not be able to acquire uh, the right people and um, infrastructure and technology, but certainly for the large players, um, it, they will look, look to um, acquire businesses where it makes uh, sense from a strategic perspective. So for instance, with regards to Morgan Stanley's recent purchase of Solius Capital, which gave it an increased foothold in its wealth management platform in terms of managing employee stock options. So I think where it makes strategic sense, acquisitions will be made, but it's not necessarily the start of a trend. 
interesting to see all the experimentation that's going on all over the place. Monsu Hussain, thank you very much. Thank you.